science over spectacle, as with everyone who objectively reviewed the body of evidence. Assemblymember Bloom has come to the conclusion, as we all have, that we can do so much better. I hope you agree that this is a tremendous opportunity to envision something new, something dignified, something sustainable, and something safe for killer whales and their human caretakers. Thank you. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Naomi Rose. I'm the Marine Mammal Scientist for Animal Welfare Institute, which is one of the oldest animal welfare organizations in the nation. And I've been working to improve the welfare of captive orcas for over 20 years. The Animal Welfare Institute wants to express its deep gratitude to the courage and conviction of Assemblymember Richard Bloom for introducing AB 2140. This bill is the first of its kind, and if passed, will prohibit the public display of killer whales in California and retire those currently in the state to a less stressful life in sea pens. And it is the first step toward ending the global exploitation of a species that was never suited to live in our world. My experience with studying orcas in the wild for my doctoral dissertation led me to believe that the welfare of this marine mammal species in particular cannot be adequately protected when confined in concrete tanks. Orcas are too intelligent, too far-ranging, too socially complex, and simply too large to adjust to even the largest captive enclosure. Ironically, it's their intelligence that makes them such desirable animals for commercial exploitation. They are beautiful, they are powerful, and their acrobatics and their ability to learn complicated tricks and understand trainer commands has been fascinating and enthralling audiences for 50 years. Yet in only the last four years, when a trainer was tragically killed in Florida, the public has learned a great deal about these animals and what goes on behind the scenes at marine parks that they never knew before. And they never knew because despite the best efforts of myself and my colleagues to educate them about these facts, the theme parks who hold these magnificent creatures have a far right, wider reach than we do. By their own count, some 10 to 20 million people a year see orcas performing at theme parks. And despite their stated mission, to educate visitors, these theme parks have a vested interest in keeping key facts from the public, leading to more miseducation than education. Now millions of these theme park visitors have also read the book Death at SeaWorld by David Kirby and seen the documentary Blackfish. Both of these chronicle the story of Tillicum, who killed his longtime trainer, Don Brancho, in 2010. Blackfish in particular, through its many airings on CNN, has reached an incredible audience, and so, it's a rare visitor to SeaWorld who has not at least heard of the controversy growing around the display of this ocean predator. Many are now aware of the mismatch between myth and fact. And I will give you some of those myths and facts, and I'm speaking to you now just as a marine mammal biologist. Orcas, unlike many zoo animals, do not live longer in captivity. In fact, they live shorter lives. And here in California alone, more than half of all the orcas ever held at SeaWorld in San Diego have died long before they reached middle age. Orcas in captivity spend hours at a time hanging at the surface in a behavior called logging. Instead of swimming dozens of miles, even hundreds, in a straight line every day. The fully collapsed dorsal fin of a full-grown adult male is not, as some believe, a sign of sadness, although it certainly seems like it ought to be. However, it is a symptom of captivity and is the result of simple, inevitable gravity, a force that has little power over wild orcas who spend most of their time below the surface of the sea. And perhaps most significant, from a welfare perspective, orcas in the wild live in family groups, mothers, sons, daughters, and grandchildren, for life. In captivity, families are rarely left intact, with sons and daughters moved about like so many chess pieces to minimize the disruption of performances and the potential for inbreeding, a problem unknown in the wild. The plain truth is, as Mr. Bloom has said, orcas do not belong in captivity. Should AB 2140 become law, it will make this truth a reality for California. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce to you Carol Ray. She's one of the former trainers who's, who is featured in the film Blackfish. Good morning. Good morning. I'd, uh, sorry. I'd first like to extend a really huge and heartfelt thank you to Assembly Member Bloom for introducing AB 2140. I'm honored to play even a small role in what I consider to be an incredibly important and potentially historic legislation. Like many people, 
I grew up as an animal lover with a curious fascination for whales and dolphins in particular. And when I found myself in the position of being an orca trainer at SeaWorld of Florida, it took me no time at all to fall completely in love with the amazing and unique animals I was working with. I considered myself to be very lucky. I spent my first days at Shamu Stadium being awed by the orcas and dazed by the incredible spectacle of the shows. I was, like the general public, fooled by the flashy veneer and the facade of happy animals. It did not take long for doubts to creep in. I worked with six orcas over the course of my employment, each of them unique with personalities as different as any six different people here today. Only one of them is still alive. As an orca trainer, I watched in absolute wonder at the birth of two baby orcas, but I also watched in horror as the original baby Shamu, Kalina, was forcibly removed from the only family she ever knew to be moved to another park. I saw and felt in my heart the mourning and desperation of her mother who was left behind. I helplessly watched an adult male orca, Can Duke, who in his obvious torment regularly rammed himself as hard as he possibly could into every solid surface in his tank. The stage area shook literally like an earthquake from the force of it. His face, his teeth, his rostrum, they were so beat up we sometimes could not bring him out to do shows because he looked too bad for the public to see. And as if it were not bad enough that he beat himself up, I recall the heartache of watching him be relentlessly attacked by the other whales regularly. There was nowhere for him to escape. As I saw it, Kanduk's life was truly a nightmare. He died from mosquito transmitted encephalitis, likely because he spent so much time logging on the surface of the water, swarmed by mosquitoes every night, something that would never have happened in the wild. I worked closely with a female orca named Gudrin, who will always have a special place in my heart. It took some time for her to adjust to her new tank and the strangers within it after being shipped to Florida from the Netherlands. Her loud and frantic cries were heard throughout the park for months. I was devastated to learn of the circumstances of her traumatic death a few years after I quit. Her third pregnancy resulted in a stillbirth, which was mechanically winched from her. She hemorrhaged and died a few days later. Regrettably and ironically, her first offspring, Taima, one of the two babies I had seen born, ultimately died similar, died of a similar complication during delivery of a stillborn. These stories are very personal to me because they're about orcas that I knew and I loved. But I know that these are only a fraction of the stories of suffering that all orcas endure in captivity. These are the things I cannot forget and they're why I am here today co-sponsoring AB 2140. I've seen firsthand what goes on behind the curtain, and I know these incredible beings deserve so much better. I'm grateful they have found a friend in Assembly Member Richard Bloom. Thank you. I'd like to introduce John Hargrove. He's a former trainer. I did not uh, write anything down, so I'm just going to wing it. Um, like Carol, uh, I'm honored to be here today. Um, this gives me an opportunity to put my money where my mouth is. I've been talking about this in interviews since Sundance and um, you know it would be so easy for me to just support SeaWorld and my my previous career um, I was a trainer killer well trainer for 14 years I resigned in August of 2012 and there was just too many things that I saw that I did not agree with um, mother calf separation uh, was one of the most outstanding ones artificial insemination which I personally performed both on the male side and the female side, I can tell you it is an invasive procedure. It is not uh, comfortable for the whales. It is not easy for the whales. And then to see these whales endure 17 to 18 months gestation after we have forcibly artificially inseminated these whales and then only to strip the calf away from the mother is heartbreaking. And um, not only me, but other trainers fought this issue with uh, senior management and we just could not win. And I believe for a long time, for a lot of years, that because of the level rank I was or the experience level I had, that I could change that. And then you have to accept that you can't change it. That no matter what you say, how hard you fight, um, you cannot stop 
corporate SeaWorld from making these decisions to separate mothers from their calves or to continue to forcibly artificially inseminate when we don't have any more space, when they refuse to spend the money to build more space, more killer whale pools. Um, and you know, those examples show you without a doubt that the killer whales are not in their best interest. This is about greed and this is about corporate exploitation both of the whales and the trainers but most importantly the whales because i was able to leave i resigned in august 2012 it was heartbreaking to do that but i was able to move on with my life those whales cannot move on with their life they're stuck in those pools and um you know before alexis and don were killed i really truly even though i had battled management on mother calf separations and artificial insemination and regularly putting our whales on a daily basis in a pool that was only eight feet deep and was the dimensions of essentially a backyard swimming pool. Um, I really truly believe that if something horrific happened to me, that SeaWorld would support me and protect me. But the way they handled um, Alexis being killed and then 60 days later when Dom was killed proved to me and then later how they took proved to me that they would never protect me, they would never support me. And it was a it was a wake up call for me and I believe it should have been a wake up call for every experienced killer whale trainer, um, every trainer in general, regardless of your level. So I'm honored to be here today. I support true legislative change and this is the way that we're gonna make it happen. So thank you all for having us and I hope this gets the momentum that it deserves, the whales deserve it, thank you.